What's going on everybody? Welcome back to another video. If you're new to the channel, my name is Reggie Bryant and this channel is all about personal finance and personal growth. And in today's video, we're going to talk about a very important topic that I've been wanting to address head on for a while. The fastest way to go broke and things that we need to stop doing. The first thing I want to talk about is giving too much. To me, that is the number one quickest way to go broke is giving too much. And what a lot of us don't realize is you can actually give your way into poverty. And what I mean by that specifically is when someone that we care about or someone that has a strong bond with us, whether it's blood or years of history with asks us for money, that's what I'm talking about. Because in a lot of cases, you might feel obligated to help them out. And once you get into the habit of doing this over and over and over again, and you give, 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 next thing you know, you're cleared out. That's a very dangerous trap to fall into because notice I said giving too much is what the problem is there's nothing wrong with giving i think absolutely if you have the money and the resources to do so definitely give if you know someone is in need i i'm totally with that but a lot of us don't realize what our own limits are with our finances so that's why i always say it's best to set aside a portion of your budget every month to give if you feel like you're going to be someone who's giving money to to friends or family that's got to be laid out in your budget so you don't give so much or more than you can afford. I know you've heard the phrase before, never give what you need right back. That's what a lot of us do. We give what we need right back and we expect the other person who's already in need of our help to pay us back as soon as possible. And they'll swear up and down, I'll pay you back. But how often does it actually happen? See, for me, I'm not willing to take that type of gamble, and I never have been. See, for me, I've grown up seeing how people are. I was like, nah, I'm, I'm not taking that type of gamble. Like, if I'm going to give somebody something, I'm probably going to tell them, don't worry about paying me back, and I'm legit not going to need that money at all. As a matter of fact, I'm going to say this. I'm going to take the phrase a little further than we just took it just now. So not only should you not give what you need right back, don't give what you need back, period. And obviously there's gonna be certain cases where you might bend or break this rule a little bit. That's gonna be up to you and your financial situation. But the reason I say that is because if you end up needing that money back, let's say you need it in like a month or two, and that person is unable to give you that money back then, and you have a problem with it and it's hurting your finances and you're starting to sink because of it, that's gonna drive a wedge straight into your relationship with that person. And you know what's worse? You're gonna say something to the effect of, I gave you my last, yeah, I can't believe you're not doing this. You know what they're gonna say? They're gonna hit you with this cold line. Yeah, but nobody told you to do all that though. So look, now it's your fault. You get what I'm saying? You know the crazy part? They are absolutely right. Nobody forced you to hand over the last bit of money you had to somebody who needed it, who you didn't have a guarantee you'd get it back from. Nobody ever forced you to do that. You did that. And that might sound harsh, that might sound cold, but that is the truth of the matter. And that is why it is one of the quickest ways to go broke. I'm not talking about if like someone's asking you for gas money or if someone needs a little help with something or if they ask for like $20, $50, like that type of stuff to me is reasonable to ask for and they might actually pay you back within the next day or something, right? But I'm talking about when someone's asking you for like rent money or multiple months of rent or well over a thousand dollars, stuff like that. If you can do it, by all means, like I, w I feel good doing stuff like that because if, if I know I can do it and I'm helping somebody that I really care about, then that's fair game. But if I don't have it, what sense does it make in both of us going broke? Because I don't know if you can pay that money back. And if I can't afford to lose this money right now, what is that going to happen? What's going to happen to me? Now I'm asking somebody for money and now that causes a never ending effect of asking for money over and over and over again. And then what are you going to do the next time this person asks you for money? You get what I'm saying? So it's best to not even fall into that trap. And I can't help but think back to the time I landed my first ever big boy job where I was making what I considered to be really good money at the time. And it never fails. You know, when you your Facebook shows the notification to everybody that you're working at one of the biggest companies in the world, people are going to reach out to you. A lot of them are going to say congratulations, but some messages are going to be like what my friend sent me. This was an old friend that reached out to me that we knew each other for such a long time. Like I'm talking from elementary school all the way throughout graduating high school. And anyway, the message he hit me up with was like, hey man, uh, need some help. Can you help me out? Can you send me some money? I was like, well... I was kind of open to the idea, but I was like, how much? She was like, $780. I was like, whoa, that's rent money. 
I, I said no on the spot. I wasn't worried about what he thought of me. I, I didn't really care. Because first of all, we hadn't talked in like three years. Second, we weren't even tight like that anymore. But how many people do you know that would have said yes? Because of our history, because of our past, because we used to be really close, I'm going to give you the $780. At what expense? At what expense, though? I was just getting started. I didn't even have $2,000 saved in my bank account yet. I didn't have it. Like, sure, I had it, but at what cost? My savings account would have been super low. And then what if something would have happened? And I needed that money right back. If chances are, if you're asking me for that kind of money, and you need it that quickly, I don't trust you to pay it right back. That would have had my savings account looking shallow. And I didn't I didn't tell him about himself or how ridiculous it was that the first time out of three years you hit me up, you want to ask me for some money. I didn't tell him about himself and I wasn't rude about it. The worst thing I said about that was no. I was nice about it, but I don't owe him anything. And that's what I'm trying to say. Like, whoever is asking you for money, if you feel so obligated to help them, you have to understand at the end of the day, you really don't owe them anything. If they try to guilt trip you or ask you for an excessive amount of money the next month and they keep just putting pressure on you to give them something like they deserve something from you, you really gotta understand you do not owe them anything. And that goes if, if they're your sibling, if they're your close friends, I can understand you wanting to help out your parents but that's like the only exception in this entire scenario that I can think of. And again, it's not to sound harsh or brash, but you have to really understand what value is there in giving someone the last bit of money you have that you can't even afford to give them that you're not even guaranteed to get back. What do you think is gonna happen? Like, chances are both of you are not gonna be in a situation where you need money from someone else. Only the next time they ask you, you're not even gonna be able to help them. And it's gonna to lead to a bunch of arguments in the future. So I just say, steer clear from all of that. Why do y'all think a lot of famous people, like once they really blow up, I'm talking basketball players, singers, rappers, actors, you name it. You know, some of the first things you hear come out of their mouth is, well, I have people I have to provide for. I have to do this, I have to do that. I have to, you know, I have to buy my mom a house and I have to buy my cousin a car. And I'm not here to say whether or not they should or shouldn't do that. I'm just saying, this is how your bank account gets cleared out by giving, giving, giving. And then if you outgive what you have, you're gonna be in a situation where you start to resent people and your bank account is gonna be looking empty. So long story short, you definitely wanna see who you wanna give anything to, if, if it's even anybody, and you wanna set aside money in your budget, whether it's like every month or like per year, how much money are you able to give to anyone? And then that's gonna put you way ahead of the game right there. Never let anybody guilt trip you into giving them money, no matter how close they are to you, because if you can't do it, you can't do it. And you have to be able to set your boundaries. Speaking of boundaries, one of the quickest ways to go broke is not having boundaries when it comes to how much you're spending every month on yourself. I'm talking about living above your means. That is one of the quickest ways to go broke. And this is the best way I can describe this. So let's say we have two people, right? And they're both single. One is making $80,000 a year. One's making $100,000 a year. The one who's making $80,000 a year is living in a modest apartment, nothing too crazy. We're talking, they're spending like $1,000 a month. And they're, they're driving a used Honda Civic from like 2009. They're not running around in flashy clothes. They're not going out to eat every single weekend. They enjoy their life but they're living below their means. And let's say this person, I'm not gonna keep saying person, I'm gonna give this person a name. Let's say Rachel from Friends, right, is making $80,000 now, but before she was making $80,000, she was living just fine off of $68,000 a year. And so once she made this 80,000, she was just like, okay, well, I'll live off of my old salary and put this extra money to good use. I could go buy that Chevy Camaro that I've been eyeing, but no, I can do that later on. Right now, I really wanna plan for my retirement. I really wanna make sure I have a fat savings, and I wanna make sure I can maximize from the money that I'm getting right now. But then over here, we have Henry, Mr. Six-Figure Status. You know what I'm saying? But let's say Henry 
before he was making a hundred thousand dollars a year he was making eighty thousand dollars a year but even when he was making eighty thousand dollars a year he had a stupid expensive car payment because he wanted to drive himself a mercedes amg on an eighty thousand dollar salary and those are like probably at the cheapest in the 70s like seventy thousand dollars which means that car payment was ridiculous let's say his car payment to be modest was like a thousand dollars a month not to mention the crazy maintenance not to mention the crazy gas on those things and i actually really like mercedes amgs that's why i'm using it in this example but anyway and he lives in a luxury apartment that costs two thousand dollars a month but because he went from eighty thousand dollars to a hundred he's like you know what it's time to get me a condo. Now we go up to $3,000 a month. So now that's an extra $1,000 a month he's paying to live in a nicer, bigger place, granted, but he's basing all of this off of his salary. And you know what else? Mr. Henry here decides, you know what? I make six figures. Let me go ahead and get another new car. In addition to my AMG, I'm gonna get me a Corvette. And so now we have two car payments, two expensive car payments, I might add. Now we have a $3,000 a month apartment that's only gonna go up as you know time goes on. And that's not including car insurance for both the cars. And that's not including all of his other expensive habits and the fact that he likes to walk around in designer clothes and designer shoes, having the latest iPhone model and going out with his friends all the time. And so if you're looking at, so if you're looking at uh, both of these people, who's broke? Not Rachel from Friends, Mr. Henry over here, because he, every, that scenario, that exact scenario I just gave you, he's not living paycheck to paycheck. He's actually going negative because he's living above his means. Like everyone, when they hear the phrase six figures, it sounds good. It sounds like it's a lot, a lot of money, but it's really easy to blow that money. Now, if he would have just stayed where he was at, stay with the $2,000 apartment, kept his AMG, he'll be in a much better place. But even that, in my opinion, is too much to be having even with a six figure salary. That's just my opinion. Because if my guy Henry over here was living like Rachel from Friends, oh, he would be stacking up. Like, I mean, think about this. What if he was able to put the extra thousand dollars he's paying on his apartment every month because he upgraded, as well as his second car payment together. So let's say that's $1,900 altogether, right? And let's say he put that into a dedicated savings account every single month, right at the beginning of the month. There, right there's a lot more than what most people can put away a month. Now let's say he cut that in half and invested half of it he would be in a much better place financially. See, Rachel, she's already ahead of the game. She's already doing that. But she's making $20,000 a year less than Henry. Henry needs to make some changes because he's on a fast track to going broke. And the thing is, everybody's gonna be looking at Henry and Rachel. They're gonna look at Henry like, oh, this man got some money. Not so. He has a lot of things, but he does not have a lot of money. He doesn't have a lot of savings. He's in debt. He doesn't have a lot of assets. And he splurges his money because he's making six figures. And his excuse is, well, I never had that much money growing up. Cool. You ain't going to have that much money when you're grown either. Acting like that. I'm just being real. But Rachel, but Rachel is being smart and she's being patient about her money. And she understands that, well, right now, it might not look like I have a lot of money, but I'm really sitting on 70K in savings and I have like 40K in investments, not including my 401K, not including my Roth IRA. So she knows she's going to be set for retirement. She's only in her late 20s. Henry over here is 48, you get what I'm saying? And that's the difference between having a plan with what you're gonna do with your money in the future and having a plan to just buy things with your money because they're two completely different things. And that leads me to my last point. Not having a plan with your money is one of the fastest ways to go broke. We've got to stop not having a plan. We have to have a plan with everything we do, especially when it comes to our finances. At the beginning of every month, that's where your plan starts. How much am I gonna spend on my budget this month? How much do I plan on saving this month? For the entire year, how much do I wanna spend and how much do I wanna have saved? A plan is, if I stay at this same salary for the next two years, am I gonna look for other opportunities or am I gonna stay the course? because inflation is gonna go up no matter what. So I might as well keep on looking and making sure that I'm growing every single year in my salary. And, and here's a fun fact for you. If you ever feel stagnant with your salary, literally, I'm not even kidding, I know this for a fact, 
job hopping, as they call it, which is not as looked down upon as you might think it is. A lot of employers don't mind it that much. But anyway, going to another company in the same position or even a higher position is going to pay you more than what you're making right now. Nine times out of ten. You just have to look for the right places. Just thought I'd throw that in there real quick. And for one, I've done it, but two, I have several friends and coworkers who've done it as well. And there's several articles on LinkedIn that say the exact same thing I just said. So if you think I'm full of hot air, look it up. I'm telling you, I know what I'm talking about. But anyway, you gotta have a plan with your money. You have to have a plan for where you're going in life. You have to have a plan for what you want your dream salary to be and, a, and an actionable plan to actually get there. How much you wanna have in your savings, how much you wanna have in your investments, you know, how much you want to be able to invest. How do you want your 401k to look when you're 50? How do you want your savings account to look when you're 70? And even and even having a plan for after you leave this world, like what do you want your legacy to look like? Like, what do you wanna leave behind for your kids or your children's children? You get what I'm saying? Like having a plan for these things makes you make smarter financial decisions because you understand, yes, money in the world is abundant, but if you spend the money you do have in abundance, you're not gonna have very much left over. You wanna plan for past, present, future. Past being debt. Okay, what is my plan for getting out of debt? What year do I wanna say I'm 100% debt free? How do I wanna do this so I can also counterbalance that with also building my savings, but also paying off my debt little by little? You don't wanna go hard on both of them at the same time. It's gonna be, one of them is gonna take a hit. But if you focus more on saving and a little less on debt, but you're paying it off little by little, you'll still have a date inside of when it's gonna be paid off. Or if your savings are looking solid, you could focus a little bit on saving and focus more on debt. It's really up to how your financial situation is looking right now. But you plan for that. You don't just say, oh, well, I'll pay the minimum payment until the end of time while the interest just keeps accumulating. Like, no, that's gonna take forever. You have to have a plan for how you're gonna make those payments graduate a little bit. You wanna look at methods, you wanna look at the avalanche method or the snowball method, even though the avalanche method is superior. You wanna look at the present, okay, you know, right now, what do I need to do to improve myself so that next year I'm making more money? What do I need to cut back on right now so that by the end of this month, I have an extra $200 saved? This is the type of calculated thinking I'm talking about that a lot of people don't have, but you've gotta develop this because if you do, you will be on top, I'm telling you. And in the future, that's investments, that's 401k, Roth IRA, that's looking into the tax advantages of both of them because they both have unique tax advantages. Your 401k won't get taxed immediately. It goes straight out of your paycheck and it accumulates interest on interest on interest. And the company matches you in most cases on top of that. So that's a lot of opportunity. But at the end, when you take it out for retirement, you definitely get taxed on it. But Roth IRA, on the other hand, is taking money that's already been taxed, your income that's already been taxed, and you're putting it in. But at the end of the day, once it's accumulated all that interest over the past 40 or so years, you take it out, no tax. You get what I'm saying? It's understanding the difference between the two. It's taking the time to read up on what your advantages are once you decide to invest in certain opportunities or, or into certain funds. These are things you need to look into when you decide which investment is best for me. Which types of funds should I be invested in? What are the advantages? What are the disadvantages? What's the cost ratio? How much money over the course of 10 years, how much could it theoretically compound if I invest in this? Like you really wanna know your stuff when it comes to that. You don't gotta be an expert, I'm definitely not one, but I know my stuff when it comes to investing. And I understand the companies and the funds that I've done research in. If, if, you, just, if you just do that and you intelligently allocate some money early on in life, to, to these types of things, your money's gonna grow and compound and you'll have something to have for yourself and for generations after you if you do it the correct way, if you focus on increasing your income, if you want to do so. So you wanna have your priorities straight. That's really the theme of this video, having your priorities straight. Instead of looking at the next cool car you see on the road or instead of seeing the next place that just looks so beautiful that you have to live in it, just because it has a nice pool view and a jacuzzi and this, that, and the third, you really wanna think about, okay, that would be great for right now, but why can't I just have that later when I've hit the pinnacle of my personal finances? That stuff can wait, the luxury can wait, but once the time is gone, cause time's gonna go by anyway. Once that time has gone by, you have now lost the opportunity to put that money in early on in your savings, in your investments.
in thinking about that, that time where you could have thought about the best way you could allocate your money, that time can be gone. You might, you might be single now, but you might have a family by the time you start thinking like this. So it's best to start thinking about it right now. While you're young, while you're the youngest you'll ever be, I might add. Because you don't want to wake up one day realizing that you're you know, in your mid-50s. It's about time to retire, and now you really can't do anything. You have nothing to show for all the years you've been working. You barely have any savings. You don't want to be that person. And the dangerous part about this video is all the ways I talked about going broke that were all the fastest ways. The thing that these three have in common also, they can also be a very slow way to go broke to the point where you don't even notice the losses you're taking. So going broke fast or slow, either way it's painful, either way it's damaging, either way they're both avoidable. But anyways, I hope you liked this video and found it helpful. I mean, I really wanted to talk about stuff that we should stop doing that, that I see people do all the time that we've all done, that I've especially done in the past. But it's about understanding what our mistakes are and then growing from them and then never making the mistake again and then passing that information on to someone else. And that is what I'm doing with this video. I hope you liked it. Anyway, that's the video for today. Thank you so much for watching. My name is Reggie Bryant and this channel is all about personal finance and personal growth so you can control you, control your finances, and control your life. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Stay cold.